Okay, hi, hello, welcome. Um, it is May of 2020, and as some of you might know, um, there's a pandemic happening just right outside of all of our doors, just everywhere. Um, but we at Word at Yale have a big belief that poetry is the only thing that can cure any illness. So we just wanted to really put all of our energy towards that tonight, right here, um, and share some of our love for words with you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's weird, it's Zoomy, um, and we're so excited about it. Usually we start our shows with our, this is my voice, and what we realize is that that takes about 20,000 hours and does not work over live stream. So we're not gonna do that. We're just gonna jump right in. Um, generally, I would be asking how many of you have been to a spoken word show? What do you do when things are cute, fun, quirky, hurt you, make you wanna sob uncontrollably in the rain? Um, I won't, we won't be able to tell if you're snapping in your home by yourself. What we will be able to tell is if you type snap snap into the little chat box, we are monitoring it. Don't worry, the surveillance state always active. So if you hear some lines, some great things um, from folks and you want to tell them that you love them, please, please, please do so. We're, as I said, always watching, always listening. And now we're going to start with our first poet of the night. Um, who has some really interesting things about him that I wanted to share with everybody. First off, um, he loves A Great British Bake Off, big fan, huge fan. Um, he's the most dedicated and sleep deprived Mariah Carey fan that any of us know. And he also just wrote a piece about Mariah Carey. Go read it, wow. Um, last but not least, here is a great quote of his, which is, I have a bad habit of running away from my problems, but it works because I'm kind of fast. Um, so without further ado, we're going to welcome, I have to find his video to pin it, so one second, Logan, yay! Oh, uh, wow, <laughs> okay. One, on our last day here, we order tropical smoothies, walk around gulping them until the teeth freeze into chipped ice in our mouths. Joy tastes better all at once, when it is constantly reminding you of its presence, when it's mixed with something familiar. So we wheeze out love songs, sing and set them to trap beats, let the streets swell with the sound of triumph gilded by our laughter, laughter being something precious enough to hold gentle between your teeth and a breath and a morning. Morning being a skyward burial of all the beauty you would have noticed the next day, and the next, and the next. I would never bury a precious part of myself in silence, an earth that does not know how to hold it without crushing. And that is why we are singing up and down Broadway like something free and black and reckless. I think this is joy I cannot savor any longer without breaking it. I think it may now have to live as an echo, as a patchwork memory, as a hook and a bomb flow until we can again fill the sidewalk first and walk only where the sun shines warm enough for us to bask in. New Haven, I built my home from people and they made a city into more than just a place to live. I think theirs is the kind of love that pulses from Bluetooth speakers nestled in backpacks, hears noise complaints and raises the volume, lives in the summits and smoothness of an Ari Lennox song, can sing truth and pain and glory in one note, something you can hear the smile in just by listening. It spills runny and sweet from styrofoam cups until it is threaded into all the unbroken beauty of this day and the next and the next. I'm not demanding to have it all back right now. I would just like to sing with you again, to build us a new home, to write us a new poem, and reach up carefree in joyous vein for all the notes we know we cannot reach. That was incredible. And that's all I have to say about it. Well, it's not all I have to say about it. We can talk about it more later if you want. Um, Logan says, please don't mind the webkins in the corner. So that, um, we love you. You're incredible. Oh, okay, more information. There's a small webkins doll. <laughs> it's great. The poem was phenomenal, incredible. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, and now we're going to be moving on to our next poet of the night. Um, who is actually a secret math major, has been trying to convince us for three years um, that math is not the major, but in fact it is. 
Um, this poet is also very interested in the Bachelor franchise in like a really intense way, which I support. But again, do with that what you will. Um, Ree reads Mrs. Dalloway every single summer. Another fact, do with that what you will. Um, also exudes both soft and chaotic energy at the same time. All of these, this list of facts must have just convinced you this poet is an incredibly multifaceted person. So, you know, just get super hyped, super excited to welcome this poet to the stage. And that poet is Kieran. That poem spits at me like a rabid dog and cross up every time I've said the words bone marrow. Spill saliva like a baptism on my sneakers, which are a metaphor for the demons I'm out running, which are a metaphor for my siblings or the things I've done in the dark or God who wrote a whole book of metaphors just so that we would stop being so selfish. But still, I find a way for every metaphor to orbit around my own heart. No, the sun doesn't rise like a resurrection each morning. The earth is just turning like it always has. I'm just a dick who can turn a phrase like I always have been and no poem is going to change that. Bad poem sinks its teeth into my calf. Says, who the hell do you think you are? Well, my blood runs like waterfall, red like wildfire. Bad poem howls to the moon, which is to say, keeps the things it loves at a safe distance, which is to say, mourns its own lonely, which is to say, I don't feel lonely these days, just nothing. Wish I had a moon to sing to. Wish they would bend down and whisper the names of all the oceans they've danced with and I'd ask if they ever call home and tell their mama that they love her and I'd say me neither. I just go to Kroger and stock up on apologies. Bad poem takes a bite out of moon and turns them into eclipse. Bad poem and me, we watch the wound form and call it blood moon. Bad poem says, blood moon, tell me, aren't you hungry? after being swallowed by the only sky you've ever allowed yourself to love. Don't you want to do the eating now? Don't you want to do the loving now? And every single time I'm hurt, just constantly all the time, it hurts a lot. Um, some some info from the, the gallery. Um, one person is a, a words with friends nemesis with Kieran. So that's fun and exciting. Um, and something related to the poem is that somebody, I don't know if any of you are on TikTok, um, but the, you know, like the thing where they're like, the volume in this bus is astronomical. Well, someone said that for the poem. Um, and I, uh, I, I agree. So that's cool and fun and quirky. Okay, so our next poet, um, keeping on with this trend of reading, which is really revolutionary. I can't believe people are doing it. Um, but this poet read Moby Dick this year, which is an undertaking of epic proportions. I am not joking. He is a scholar. Um, he also invented being kind and sweet and gentle. And somebody said that being around him is like wrapping yourself up in a warm blanket forever and ever. I wasn't on camera I would start sobbing that's incredible and beautiful and to wrap it all off he's got our future president which is so exciting ah okay and now without further ado please welcome Oscar how much hurting did it take birds unfurling out through her teeth like willow branches. The wind carries as much as it can, but it can't cleave every burdensome leaf off her fingertips. And we are, despite ourselves, grateful for this. Grateful for this spring, despite the agony of blossom, that out there is a beauty as deep a blue as our worst days. When I was younger, I could carry the melody with a quiet hum, watching Mama sing like maybe she'd once snapped a wishbone, praying that the letting go was providence. This music makes me proud of all that's pretty and ugly in me. My wrath, my cynicism, my hope, my love. No child is too young for loneliness and most adults can't name their pain. 
but on nights when I can't begin to write or speak of the world. And nowadays, the nostalgia is killing people. On a decade-old YouTube video, they say, this was a cry for help. Say she needed a friend, like there aren't clear aching calls for something as good as anything sent into the sky by the living right now. But in a church in Ireland, a set with bass and guitar, I think I know what they mean. The urge to turn away, Amy's eyes glossed with tempest, that you've seen something you shouldn't have, that now you've got to carry that with you, realize you've been carrying it all this time. Please don't misunderstand me. There's the good humor too about ourselves saying fuck it and fuck you when we don't mean a word of it. I don't want to consider the weight of a laugh or the times I've made music of a name when there was no one there to listen. Amy, in that ether of eternity, Monk and Bennett watch the storm clouds expire every bit of their water, knowing that there is still crying even after all of this. And they want to show you every loved word you never heard makes you wonder whether any of us did right by our own lives. No, we remember the glories too, how a voice so light could pull tight on the arms holding all of us together and remind us that we are whole in ourselves and with each other. I know every road between North London and the rest of the world wasn't paved with the intention of their meeting. It just sort of happened that way. And maybe there's the silver lining that a call rang out and someone caught it in their throat became a cry, became a laugh, was both. And I believe you when you say love is a losing game. And I know what you mean is that we never played to win. Not to be incredibly dramatic, but those are the only words I ever want to hear for the rest of my life. Um, and I'm pretty sure most people agree because somebody said that Oscar invented poetry which he did. Um, and someone else said when he started, I know I'm about to hurt, um, which we then did. So I think we're all aware of what's going on right now. I'm just really glad we're all on the same page. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Oh, angry about it. <sighs> okay. Well, our next poet, also incredible, very young, a baby. This is not her first show. So we don't need to, you know, do the baby thing, but you know, just so you know, she's a child. Um, we're all children, whatever. Um, anyway, our next poet is so tiny, but could probably take you out with one single word automatically. Um, she also has a coat with little bee patches on it that we all really miss seeing. And I sent out a little, as I said, a poll, like a, a Google form for people to say some things about our members. And several people brought up scribble.io. So if you want to be like bested in intellectual combat, like meet her on that battlefield. And I'm sure she'll, she can take you. Um, without further ado, please welcome Baylina to the stage. We are not examining the art in a museum. The art is examining us. Face over face, skims over purified lips, and I am 14 years old staring at a painting of Prometheus. An eagle sits calmly on his chest, beak at his flesh as if pulling a loose thread, its eyes scrutinizing every inch of me just as I do the same to it. I like to imagine Prometheus as an artist. I think of the gods and their art and Prometheus watching the people below, so helpless he thinks they need civilization, but who knew that salvation requires a crucifixion, that art and knowledge are earned through suffering. Rewind back to senior year, when I had all my college essays memorized, when the birds feeding outside my house meant almond and superstition, when everything had to be done in twos or sevens or threes, but never fours, four, Unlucky number four, a homophone for death in Chinese, four, the four cars outside my house, foreshadow doom when I'd have to count six beats between the tones of a phone call to keep myself sane, tell me how many rituals it takes to make a religion, and maybe Prometheus was wrong. We all know he stole fire from the gods for us, for creation, but maybe it was a mistake to show us perfection, a glimpse of a heaven we could never reach. You realize nothing in this world is perfect. Pythagoras too thought it was, thought every number could be expressed in exact proportions. Did you hear that a guy told Pythagoras about irrational numbers and Pythagoras pushed him off a boat? You might say, damn, I aspire to be that level of petty, but really, can you blame him? 
Can you blame him for losing his mind at a world that he thought operated by reason, that this world governed by law and calculation is actually in a constant state of entropy? I still pick apart my own skin every day as if I could correct my own body. Each finger has to feel mathematically perfect. I peel around my fingernails until they bleed in kindergarten. My teacher asked us to come in after class so she could trace our hands for a poster and I almost cried, tried to refuse, tried to hide my hands as if carrying a weapon, but the truth is they were the weapon and the wound. Isn't it ironic that in order to be perfect, we have to mutilate ourselves? I wish that this poem could just be about art and not pain. I wish perfection weren't synonymous with obsession, but perhaps you cannot paint the right shade of crimson without your own blood. And I don't know if I am Prometheus or his eagle or both unfolding my own flesh, the cause of my own ruin and resurrection. Perhaps the real tragedy of Prometheus is that he had so much left to give. Who could have known that when he brought us the fire, he would burn too? I am 14 years old again in the museum, watching the eagle tear his body to shreds just as I'm plucking apart my own hands. And I want to know, did the eagle look in his eyes and laugh and ask, why do you weep? I am only making you better. After class, when I went up to my teacher, I didn't look her in the eyes. She raised her eyebrow at me and beckoned me closer. Slowly, she took my arm from behind me and sprawled my fingers on the yellow paper. I held my breath thinking ugly, irregular, asymmetrical. She smiled and told me, you have such beautiful hands. Listen, listen, all I have to say is that we absolutely all of us aspire to that level of lyricism. Ooh! The audience is saying chills. Um, I die times two and other things that I can't read right now, but <laughs> all to say that was incredible and phenomenal and all you, there's only space to grow because you're incredible and you're already so good. Ah, okay. I'm going to stop that now. Great. Cool. Okay. So our next poet, fun, um, <laughs> is someone that I've spent a lot of time with over the past four years. This person is somebody in my tap class. Um, and I think there are a couple of things I could say about him, but I'll start by saying that his personality is composed of reptiles. Um, reptiles, and this third one might be like a really big surprise, um, but reptiles. So that is, if you don't know him, you might think I'm over-exaggerating, but I think that's all you need to know. In addition to the fact that he's very sweet and kind and caring and will listen to you for hours and sit with you on a bench inside of the Sultan Courtyard and talk until 2 a.m. just because. But primarily, he is reptiles and reptiles only. He also created um, the worst food known to man, um, which is Pop Cubed. Ask him about it. I don't wanna talk about it. Um, and he owes basically every single person in the whole entire world a playlist, which he promised um, two years ago he would create and still nothing. Um, so you can accost him about any of those things later, but right now, get ready to be dazzled by his work. And this poet is Kamau the Quiet Warrior Walker. Many truths were spoken. Playlists are still pending. Hands are only worth the shit they carry. My mom's hands used to be worth a whole book of songs. Now it's just whatever fare me and my sister might need. My mother wanted a chocolate drop. So she held me on the porch once I was born, offered me to the sun. My grandma said, keep holding him like that. You're gonna kill that boy. She didn't take me on the porch no more. The problem with history is that it assumes a future where God is always lonely, one where he is holding too tight. I was taught that men drown carrying gold, all because they refuse to let go. I keep my hands empty. My mom named me. Obasi means in honor of God. Kamau is a warrior, the quiet kind. My mom started a war in my name. 
I don't know if God knows my worth, but my mother still wants to hold me tighter nowadays so she can know she is still worth my breath. My dad say he don't got no friends, just me and my mom. He used to sit on the porch while the other kids ran outside. In high school, my dad carried a baritone in his throat. A girl he might have loved was afraid of his voice whenever she couldn't see the boy it was attached to. When he said hello, she dropped her textbooks. He's held his voice since that day. My dad named me. Lloyd is after my mother's father, a man worth a saxophone, a man who loved my father's voice, a man cremated on my first birthday. My dad always held me like a prayer he was afraid to voice. It's about postponing the longing until we can feel again. Strangers still ask my father if he recognizes the gift in his throat what memory must put your voice through for you to call silence relief. I wonder how he carries that loneliness, probably the same way fish carry the rain. I'm only worth the quiet between my fingers and an intermittent knowledge of reptile ecology. It's about understanding how we relate to this earth, even in our solitude. I have a bad habit of falling in love with anyone who will talk to me about lizards. Unfortunately, Walker is not a name I dream of passing on to anyone. History should stop somewhere. Surely love must be worth more than shackles. Nowadays, I got a whole room full of hands that ain't mine and a handful of rooms I'm locked out of. I'm not good with keys or anything small enough to be obscured by my palms. So I only reach for the music flooding Derek's car. Derek says, a puppy sounds like a dumbass gift. Here, have this intense sadness in seven years. I look out the door and don't see my city. I know he's right. We only came back for the funeral. We always come back for the funeral. It's the year our classmate's little brother died or the year our classmate died. Could be the year my dog died, or the year my uncle died, or the year my aunt died, or the year my aunt died. I'm afraid of imagining people. Memories dissolve every time we grasp for them. Faces do too, eventually. You're only holding a name. Thank you. You might be wondering if your audio isn't working. Um, it's fine. I just am literally speechless. Um, listen, I know this is a family show and all, but what the fuck? <laughs> that really hurt. Um, so that's cool. Yeah, I don't. I'm. I'm sorry. I don't. I can't. I can't say any other words because I'm still processing. <laughs> as I'm sure the rest of you are. Okay, yeah, cool, great. Um, <laughs> this is very exciting and great. And our next poet is also exciting and great, and I love her. A fun fact about this poet is that we um, went to high school together. Don't ask us about it. Um, so she, you know, is originally from Chicago, Illinois, a, a superior city to the one where she now unfortunately lives, New York City. Um, and in New York City, she was touched on the head. Just on the subway, somebody just touched her on the head. That's it, that's the whole story. Um, another layer to that, which has nothing to do with what I just said, is that she's an incredible person and also has an incredible Zen garden in Animal Crossing. Ask her about it. She would love to, to hear about it. Also ask her about Terrace House, her favorite television show on Netflix, watch it. Um, and last but not least, um, just one half hour ago, she said these words, um, and I would like to share them with you now. <clears throat> I made a cooking account because I fucking love attention. That's it. That's, that's the whole quote. If you want to follow it, I think it's Christina Cooks, like Christina, but in a baby voice with a W. Um, 
go do that. So that's fun and cute. Um, yay, Christina. Thank you, Prisca. <laughs> On January 11th, 2020, Chinese state media report the first death from coronavirus. 20 days later, a French newspaper flings a 128 point font across an image of a Chinese woman wearing a purple mask, commanding the nation's attention to the yellow alert. Another headline interrogates the world new yellow peril. And in America's mind, the woman her name and personhood hidden behind the mask transforms into an anonymous synonym for sickness and radiates the color of the sun. On March 6, 1900, a Chinese man dies of bubonic plague in the basement of a hotel in San Francisco Chinatown. A day later, city authorities surround the neighborhood with a single cord of rope. I imagine it yellow like caution tape. Before America's eyes, Chinatown transforms into a cage for sick rats and Chinamen. Slowly, it becomes difficult to distinguish between them. In an American pandemic, person mutates into pathogen, we evolves into them, and they are no longer human. A beautiful scanning electron microscope image shows the virus emerging from the surface of human cells in a vivid yellow the same as the skin tone of a slant-eyed bug tooth caricature of a woman with the spherical virus replacing her breasts and bugs, a frog leg, and a fishtail hanging out of her mouth with skin pangolins in each hand. On an advertisement for rat poison, a caricature of a Chinese man swallows a rat, no, his kind whole. It clears out rats, mice, bedbugs, flies, roaches, and Chinese, they must go. A pamphlet distributed to San Francisco householders suggests large cage traps for killing. Bait, to be changed daily between cheese, fish heads, chicken heads, fried bacon, fresh liver, and pine nuts. Did you know that viruses are not considered alive? They infect and replicate themselves inside cells until there are enough of them to explode out from the host and kill it. A few Chinamen would have no perceptible effect. They could be easily digested by the national stomach. But multiply units by millions and the matter becomes exceedingly serious. Trump calls it the Chinese virus as American bodies pile into a pair of trucks parked outside of a funeral home in Brooklyn. Physicians call the plague an oriental disease. Of 167 cases of plague reported in a single month, only eight of its victims were Chinese. In the Bronx, four teenage girls assault a middle-aged Asian woman on the bus. They tell her she caused coronavirus and I think about my mother. Public health officials in Honolulu decide that Chinatown must be purified by fire. Devoted to its nation, the ocean breeze blows a little harder that day. A fountain of burning embers grows 60 feet tall and Chinatown loses temples, churches, theaters, warehouses, stores. I read about how women with strained eyes and tears rolling down their cheeks clung to little children and babes and I think about my mother. Someday, after this pestilence fades into national memory, they will speak of how they waited for locusts for flies and frogs and water turning into blood and they will laugh. On the subway, we will stand just a little further away. After the fire, there was only smoke and rubble, no baptism. Instead, Chinatown was rebuilt with the houses standing just a little further apart. Our stomachs are full of grievances, but to whom can we tell them? We can pace to and fro, scratch our heads, and question the blue sky. Yeah, she she did that. She wrote that entire poem. And I think later we will be like sending out um, 
non spoken versions of the poems and it's like it's it's really cute on the page is all i'm saying um and i know that you know we truly do love to make lots of jokes about this time but there's a lot going on i think christina just captured a lot of it so 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 beautifully um and as someone in the audience says all caps goodness gracious i'm sorry i did that voice i didn't mean to um but it was incredible thank you so much um and now our next poet is also in my tap class, unfortunate news. Um, there are a lot of things about this man that people know and believe and think. And today I, I won't be saying anything negative because why would I do that? We love each other here. What I will be saying instead is that there um, are arguments on campus about whether he's the most universally liked person on on our campus um and the person who submitted this says that they think that it's true and i don't disagree with them i walk down the street with him and 25 different people stop us and he will have full conversations with each of them no matter what it's raining we talk and then we walk and then we're soaked so that's fun um next he is um funded by big dairy which you might know if you witnessed his milk presentation um which happened I think last week, he's currently making a very shocked face because he doesn't want um, us to, to know that that's what's going on. For anyone who's confused, please, for the love of God, do not ask him about it because he will give you a presentation about milk, after which someone literally asked him to send it to him be, or to send it to them because they thought it was his thesis. That's how much energy he put into this. Anyway, last thing, because we do have to actually get to the poetry, um, is that he took one of his pottery classes this semester online, which is kooky and still had a great time. And also he makes a mean lasagna. So without further ado, please welcome Sydney. <laughs> Hello, I, uh, I think Priska had a little wrong. I will not uh, give you a presentation. I have the presentation recorded and can send it to you at, and you can watch it at your leisure. Um, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> what have you done, replied the Lord. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has opened its mouth up to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its produce to you. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Genesis 4.10. The acre is a semi-state. Only a half meadow lies in the wake of a petal's grief and somewhere under the fish eye of starlight an entire field is belting its swan song. Ballad gutted over basin hums its last notes into a softening soil. The Greeks have the same word for valley as for egg and it's, it's funny like that. The things that find their way out of fracture. Plastic flowers pool in the hollow until it is thick enough to lift the tombstone from the weed's fingers and the body dances once more, floating on the fog of a stubborn vigil. It's always the first rose to twirl out of the figure field that's plucked and it's funny like that, the way a bloom promises decay. A double coincidence for this swollen head of a bulb too heavy to raise towards an abstaining sky, a midnight cheek turned in disgust in humility of the land's undressing. Instead, the bloated blossom is bent over the earth in mid-study, squinting against the glare of slit ley lines. What is seed is first scar, but what wound is worth beauty when every wound is a weed, a hydra sprout sp hissing under the kiss of leaf on air. And it's funny like that. Somewhere beneath the land, a maze eats its maker for the first time and the gnashing of stone against body makes some kind of bone snap, soothes the knot straight. When prayer sinks under the weight of broken promise, consumption is the last sacrament. Cain is left with his spade and stone and grass that still flinches at the threat of blood and the valley closes its lips around the soured air without protest. Settling for rancid, settling for dust, settling the score once more. And it's funny like that because it's, so young 
because it's all so young, because what is flesh and not fledgling in the crook of a field? It's over. <laughs> you know, I know it's over. I was just taking a moment to really let it sink in. Yeah, what's happening in our current Zoom chat right now is just a lot of people saying different variations of damn, damn, different different caps. Um, and I agree. That was incredible. Oh my God. Ah. Um, what's happening in the YouTube, as you guys can see, is um lots of people talking about um the background. I don't have answers. I don't think any of us have answers. Um, and also someone says they want to wrap himself inside of his words and stay there. And you know what? Yeah. Um, we have this distinction in word performance poetry at Yale, um, which is between saying things poets and um, mood poets. And Sydney is very firmly a mood poet. And if you were not just transported somewhere by his words, then I don't know what's up with you. Anyways, our next poet. Um, yeah, I have a lot of things to say about this poet. Um, one of our co-presidents for the year. Yay. Um, a, couple of, a couple of facts about this poet. Um, which is that this poet is part of French speaking word, which is not um, a word that you might think exists. And it doesn't. It's just people in word who have at some point taken French classes or spoken French. So that's fun and cute. You can ask the poet about speaking French if you want to. Um, this poet also invented all books someone said in the Google forum. And I don't disagree. Um, this poet has probably read more books in the past week than any of you have read in your entire lives. It's just a fact, it's a fact. Another scholar, another poet, another incredible, fantastic, phenomenal human person whose words you'll get to hear right now. Yay, Irene. The host has spawn led you and unmute, unmute yourself. Um, so this poem is dedicated to my beautiful friend, Noah Tattleman Parnes whose birthday is on we turning 21 in quarantine and whose first word show is today, even though we've been friends for three years. I love you very much. I cannot speak to the magnitude of cemented times, these times, these unstable times or any of the synonyms for life altering that I may have used when emailing you. To be honest, on the mornings when I'm content with the simple gift of Nescafe and a nice book, I can barely muster anything approximating the grander feelings I was looking for. But as Ina Garten once said, if you can't make your own serotonin, store-bought is fine. And so Carly Rae Jepsen does it for me and cuts straight to the fucking feeling, deposits my heart to the basement of someone I love and runs away with, twirls me around my kitchen, Tomato sauce simmers, is any floor the dance floor if you believe in it, says celebrate. What else are you going to do with motion? Says I will not leave you deserted on your island of the ever. This is the kingdom of our desire. Gaze upon its majesty. It's a party now that you're here. You are in the center of the dance circle and the DJ is taking your requests all night long. We live in the dot balanced in the middle of E motion. Behold our endless string of tomorrows. You too can be happy not knowing. I mean, you'd better be. There is no more future comfortable than the present. I will transfigure endless distances coupled with your lack thereof. I know your house is growing smaller every day. So throw up the lush light of pop and make the of each and every night. You cannot convince me the soda bubbles of your heart have fallen flat. I know the deep wells of ebullience that live inside you. I nourished them long ago for times. There are no runs at the supermarket on yearning. Don't you know scarcity is a myth propagated? I know you still pray at the altar of too much and not enough that you baptize your want in bubblegum synth and pink wine and dance floor sheen and tube tops off the clearance rack. I will carry you till you can and be held again. And so here we are, scalding the roofs of our mouth, unevenly reheated leftovers, back pressed up to the refrigerator, the closest I will get to a proper 
intimacy of a crowd for months, and when the smoothest sax known to the ears of humankind comes on at the top of Run Away With Me, I turn it up, I play it loud, and I dance before the water on the stovetop boils over. Um, that was a really small scream, but it doesn't capture how I really feel, which is um, a big scream. So that was incredible. Thank you. I do feel seen and heard by that poem, as I'm sure everybody does. Um, I also feel like, never mind. Okay, great, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now our next poet. Um, there, there's some interesting things to say about this person, which I know I've said before every single like trio of facts I've said about someone, but they've all been so interesting, right? Um, so this next poet almost became an expert in invertebrate structure last semester. And I read those words on the forum and I didn't question it, even though I didn't remember exactly what whoever put that in was talking about because it it's on brand and it makes sense. Um, next on the list, is that she did in fact invent being hydrated, but the unfortunate um, connection to that is that she does such a terrible job of taking care of every single water bottle she's ever owned. Like the third thing I ever learned about her is she came into meeting and was like, you guys, I've done something terrible. And I'm not gonna tell you the terrible things she did because I'm not in the business of exposing people, but I will just suffice it to say, that I was scared for her health after seeing the state of her water bottle. Anyway, on to better things. Um, she's going to be the new editor-in-chief of Broad Recognition next year, which is so exciting. Yay! That was a really small clap. I could have clapped louder. Um, but anyways, she um, created words, invented words, and is now going to say those words right into your screens. Woo! Please welcome Caitlin. Oh, it didn't work. Um, my internet's kind of spotty, so hopefully this works. <laughs> I break like promises and I've still never really written a love poem. I collect the undead gifts from boys who love me sorry, strip the items of their memories until they are bare house and barren womb and they rest on my bookshelf like they do not breathe. They say to write what you know. I write poems about the way my mother makes bibimbap and divorces her own name. I write poems for the carnivore whistles that follow me down sidewalks and for the missed calls that have no intention of being returned. But I still can't write love poems. Maybe it's because I've given away so many parts of myself, the way women in my lineage always have because lovers pull my ribs out and I can never wait long enough before letting someone else undo the sutures because Asian women are taught that love is another word for making yourself invisible. Maybe this is why we always seem to disappear when cameras come around. Maybe this is why we cannot pick ourselves out in photographs like ghosts or vampires or women taught that their lives are an unseeable thing and men have buried parts of me all over this country. Maybe that's what they meant by diaspora. I have only ever been taught love as the taking, the taking, the taking, and maybe that's why my mother's country keeps falling underwater. A love poem. I promise I still love. Memories are not breath. My mother divorces her carnivore. Being returned can love, and maybe it's because I've given myself love and never wait long for someone else, long before the sutures. Love is invisible. Maybe we disappear. Maybe we are buried. Maybe that's what they meant by love and water. Yeah, once again, I'm undone by the words, the brain power, absolutely all of it. Yeah. Oh, 
oh my god okay <laughs> um uh, from from the chat um someone says i can't curse so i can't say what i feel but just know it has a lot of curse words in it and as i am trying to keep this once again a family friendly show um yeah i agree okay. anyway next poet very exciting another baby Ooh. okay um this is a fact that I either heard and then immediately repressed or wasn't there when it was shared. But apparently this poet has a life-size cutout of Angela Merkel in his room. Like, like of Germany. Oh, oh no, there it is. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't think you guys can see that, but he turned his camera on. Maybe he'll do it again once I spotlight him. But that's there. Oh, he's not going to do it again. You've missed out, but it's there. I can confirm now that it's definitely there. Um, anyway, secondly, he's a Midwest superstar. Love it. Phenomenal. Um, he's also currently raising a flock of awkward looking teenage chickens, which I'm very excited about. Um, yeah. And also the last most important thing, second only to the incredible words he's going to speak to you, is that it's his birthday tomorrow. Oh, my God. Kooky. Okay, well, welcome, Forrest. Under the porch light spins a cloud of winged honey ants. This is the only time they will fly. After mating, the young queens will fall to the ground and rip off their wings in preparation for digging nests. Most will die. Even now, hundreds of ants starve underground, having regurgitated the nectar in their stomachs into the mouths of the departing queens. Their deflated bodies hang from the walls of the nest chambers, the translucent cavities of their abdomens glowing like small jewels. Soon they will be dragged to the graveyard by their siblings. And I know already what you are thinking, that this is the way of life, why worry for the wretched fate of the individual when the wholeness of the empire presses in? A hundred miles from the porch light, a cleaning crew enters the bloodied cavern of a meatpacking plant. They have been ordered back to work. Like the starved ants, they are both necessary and deemed expendable, their lives of less importance than the continued butchering of the pigs, whose pink flesh they scrub from the blades of the decapitator whose manure they sweep into the drains. And really, what is life but the constant processing of the world's shit? In a nest under the front yard, a nectar-drained ant falls to the chamber floor. Above my head, a queen traces a senseless arc through the porch light lit air. I pray now for the ants, for us all. Um, one of the saddest parts of not being in the same room together is that we can't all snap really loudly, but that poem happened and in my brain, I just heard the snaps going off, which is to say that that was phenomenal, incredible, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Okay, so next we have a um, big, huge shocker, yet another poem. Um, this poet is also a little baby a little cinnamon baby, the best kind of baby. Um, some things that were said about this poet in the, 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 the little formo is that one, she is a legend. Several people, like maybe half of the responses were just that she dresses really well and that walking around campus, she makes other people feel bad because she's so well-dressed. So that's fun. If you see her on campus next year, I hope you don't, I, I hope you feel better I guess, after being decimated by her style. Um, the second thing is that she invented Philadelphia. And I don't think I have to say anything more than that. I think that sinks and it makes sense. Um, and the third thing is that she is the coolest word member and we all know it. And I'm not gonna agree with that, but I am gonna say it's not wrong. So <laughs> without further ado, please welcome Cassidy.
the sink where I undress myself. The sink where my hands undress themselves is porcelain, but nose red like a sea of blood, swirling down the melting pot's throat where anything heavy with color sinks, a bottom no one sees, a weapon that shreds but doesn't kill. The sink is always consuming color, so is never stained. The throat, why the sink is still porcelain. I bow my head and drown myself for an instant to be clean. The water in the font is hot enough to convince me drowning will make me warm on the inside. I pull myself up and my hands realize the melting pot is cold. It is snowing on the other side of the window. It is snowing and it is springtime. The snow piles into walkways and classrooms and cultural centers and maybe my body, I cough and it melts. My body is sickening, but at least I am clean. I don't have many friends at school. All the black kids are filled with snow. I ain't warm enough to melt with them. There might be something ghastly about the way I move. To leave no footprints where I walk, to walk into rooms and evaporate into thin air. There is little place here for the parts of me I brought from back home. So I keep them tucked away inside until it feels like they've been misplaced. Like I've kept myself so tidy that I've left everything go. My nose has bled into a porcelain sink more times in one year than it has in my entire adolescence. I question why all my warm parts are leaving me, what all the blood is running from, and finally realize why I am so cold here. I think the snow is piling inside of me too. Maybe this is what whiteness feels like, walking into a black body, a gust of wind through the door left ajar by a careless intruder that didn't know the home they were walking into, where to take their shoes off how to greet the hostess, but knew how to move in and push everything else out in the process, how to walk down a street and burn down the neighborhood without breaking a window, watch the houses bleed, watch the streets swirl with blood and think them becoming more palatable, watch the debris scatter and fall like snow, pack it tightly into porcelain brick and build a city pretty of snowmen, homeless spirits evicted from themselves, crumbling cadavers that don't remember when they were unmade, maybe, I mistake hugging another black girl, dark thing for clawing at what I thought my blackness looked like or looking in the mirror for seeing myself, a dark girl thing or seeing myself an act of love. Maybe I mistake love for something that can survive in cold places, hug black girl tighter, hoping she can take what's left of me with her to wherever she revives herself. She lets go and I am answered with the resounding realization that no neighborhood can keep out whiteness, that snow is brilliant enough to make the air around it and stand still, watch as it tears through that West Philly and the quad and all the places where bodies like mine gather to make fire are all dark things, ethereal and appetizing, that will have to bow before the same beast that will be unmade in the same throat that there won't be a trace of when the snow is done melting. Blackness takes its arms from around my body and I bow my head, drown myself for an instant to be clean. I turn the faucet off, watch my blood swirl, slink into a sunken place at the bottom of the drain and I don't look up to watch myself leave. I stay here wondering when I was unmade. I'm not sure how long I've been gone, but I never come back. The way in which we are all in different rooms and yet I felt the air sucked out of our collective room that we are in together. In your own words, sickening. <laughs> Someone said they threw out all of their books because all they need is that. And you know what? Yeah, that, that is all I have to say. Um, someone said they want the poem tattooed on their forehead. I think you would maybe have to ask for copyright reasons, but I, yeah, I agree. Anyway, um, there's more hurting to come, so I'm not gonna dwell too much. Um, so our next poet is another co-president, woot woot. Okay, that felt bad immediately right when I said it, I'm so sorry. Um, still very excited that she's a co-president. Um, there are a lot of things I can say about this person, but I think the thing that feels the truest um, and also the thing that all but one response on the the form, form, 
form um, said, um, is it Lizzie? Is maybe the person that I've met who most vehemently denies being a horse girl, and yet with every single interaction, seriously, every single interaction we have confirms that that is in fact what she is. That's it. Someone said horse mom, that one's new, but I'm not gonna disagree with it. It feels true. Um, if you wanna talk to her about it, I'm sure she'd be willing to talk about it. Uh, something non-horse related, which is that she is slowly but surely becoming an honorary employee of coffee with um, a K. Um, any conversation you have with her, she will suggest you go to coffee with a K. Of course, after the pandemic, because that's unsafe. Um, but so if you ever want to hang out with her, go there and she'll probably be there or alternatively go to the great state of Montana and just like yell out, Lizzie. And I'm sure, you know, you could find her. So without further ado, here's Lizzie. Thank you, Fariska. That was a great description. Lessons from my mother's garden, one. The garden should be an extension of your joy, but not an obsession of your nature. If you find that you are constantly snatching at weeds, you will never let the chaos grow big enough to pluck it by the root you can leave for a week. Sometimes life grows on better without needing to get your hands dirty too. The garden grows by itself. Nothing you say or do will make it stay alive past its willingness to survive. A gardener is not a goddess of life. They change nothing about the plant, just the surroundings. Do not think you can fix everything. Three. If the plant is rotten, it is not the fault of the soil or the gardener, just the seed. So make sure to remember to turn over each pit before you plant it. The rot is not always visible unless you look closer. Remember, if you are planting to be nourished, don't waste your energy putting faith in a bad seed. Four, save the stem, not the flower. Learn to love the living before they have anything to show for it. If you strike at the root of everything that looks dead, nothing will live to see the blooming. Five. People are like plants. They bloom when they are tended to. And wherever two or more are gathered, there is a garden. A daughter's response after a breakup, one. This garden did not last the winter, mom. But do not think there wasn't an extension of joy. If planting is another form of a promise, then what we created was an Eden. We grew in the moonlight of every warm and dry autumn afterthought. We were not obsessed, but we were loyal. The blooming in our eyes spoke of a future fruit that for once wasn't forbidden to dream of what an earthly heaven too. I did not think I could fix everything, but I thought I could fix myself and there lay the mistake. When you would uncoil from me and hold your wrist with your own hand, when you would tell me, kiss me, but still wanted to date me, when came a heavy and dead thing, I did not hate you for the way our garden grew, for the twisting and bitter taste it left on my tongue. I just dug myself a little deeper, unhinged my jaw so I wouldn't bite with my words and search through myself to strike at the root of this failure. Do you know what it feels like to split an ax on yourself over and over and over, a splintering of your own self-confidence, the kindling of everything you hate about yourself, to wake up and find pieces of you scattered across a city to chop trees in your own Eden searching for an apple without realizing there had never been any fruit to begin with. It wasn't until I lost 10 pounds in three months that I realized all that we had been doing was feasting on a famine. I did not realize that in resuscitating something that refused to grow it was killing me instead. Again. I do not hate you for everything I lost. Three, if the plant is rotten, it is not the fault of the soil or the gardener, just the seed. I won't fully blame what happened on a lack of trying or on a place like Yale. We knew there was something rotten even when this began. 
Don't tell me you could have loved me better in a different place or with more time. Just as I won't tell my daughter to fertilize what is already dying for. Still, I want you to know that I loved you even when you were blooming. I loved you on the nights you planted yourself by the window and set your face to the moon like a darkened sunflower. I love you in the splintering, in the brittleness, in the growth, lulled sleepy in this hibernation. A goddess is not a gardener of life, but I trusted in the witchcraft that you said was between us, don't worry. I don't mean for this poem to be another ax to our relationship, but I do want to taste something like truth again, so five. You told me to never perform a poem about you, but it is springtime. And I know you are somewhere in the world blooming. This promise between us is dead, but you and I aren't. And I can picture you now beautiful, open and thriving and a joy to see after this winter. I am writing this to say, look at yourself. You are not a bad seed, even if what was between us ended rotten. Lesson six of a mother's garden. There is always going to be another season to grow. Yeah. Someone, um, someone in the Zoom just hit the whoa and I agree. Yeah, um, that was phenomenal. We will love you in this season and in this place and also forever for that beautiful piece of work you just delivered to us. Thank you. Mm, yeah, yeah. I can't say anything else. Okay, next. Um, we have another baby exciting. Um, this baby is anti-monoculture lawn, strong stances only. Um, she invented embroidery and I'm not joking about it. I think she is the person I would trust the most with any kind of like any sort of craft related thing. In, in, in this little formy dude, um, she said she spent the past week trying to perfect her technique for making oat milk. I can guarantee that technique was perfect to begin with. So now it's just going to be like heaven in a cup. Okay, sure. Wow. Last but not least, she loves papayas, small birds, the color green, and this person said she is the actual sun. And you know what? They're right and they should say it. So... Please welcome to the virtual stage, Elena. Wow, my heart is truly pitter pattering right now. That was very sweet. Pause, says the world, when the unidentified inklings of spring have come again to blossom near the windows like they have every year since we settled here have begun again to sprout in a place I was brought back to just as suddenly as I am starting to pick apart the pieces of it and put them back together. Here, take this as a map of all the wild things that have become of my home. Starting from the creek that lines both sides of the driveway where my brother, smaller of my two, red-faced, short-tempered, dove into like a crawfish. And after he emerged, a shade of purple blossoming on his arm from the edge of a sharp rock, he asked, here is where? The outskirts, the weeds, the ugly enveloping of a pristine woods at the epicenter and the creek bank on which I sat the other day, watching no cars drive by, listening to no noise except for birds flying between the branches that swayed above me. It's been years since the last great storm. And my father still hasn't cleaned up the trunk of a fallen tree splitting our yard down the middle. It is so quiet out here with no people, he says. There's always been no people. 
just fenced in dogs and the hawk that circles above the trees once a day when I'm sitting in the uncut grass and father comes outside to sit on the porch and stare at the movements of small things. You know, we are really trying to be together again in the same little square of house. He sleeps upstairs now in the room that used to be my brother's away from my mother downstairs, and they are happy with this subtle distance, neither of them being able to cope all that well anyway. In the middle of the night, father gets up to check on me, pretending to turn on the heat, but it is the edge of summer here, and I sweat under a blanket printed with white and yellow and pink flowers every year he cuts them. And they keep coming back, sprouting in a garden overrun by blue weeds. He keeps saying he has so much to do here, before the mortgage makes us leave. But it has been years of everything unchanged. The creek, the grass, the porch, the house, the trees, the steps, the flowers, the water here. The rising sun is stuck behind the unlit bulb of a street light. False illumination of the golden air floating around my father's place on the porch where I sit this morning while he and my mother are still asleep inside the first light rain in months, and I am trying to see him in a different light. Uh, yeah, I was scrolling through um, the like widgets of people's faces and every single face was um, what I was told on Wednesday is the baby simp emoji. Um, so I, if that doesn't say absolutely everything you need to know about that poem and about Elena, I don't know what else could. Actually, I do know one more thing that could, which is that she's starting an embroidery business and I do not have any details. Email her <laughs> if you want to buy some shit from her. It's very good. It's beautiful. Okay, cool, 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 cool. <sighs> okay, next poet is also a member of my tap class, Kuki, once again. Um, so we have we have some some fun things to say about this person, just, just to say them out loud. Um, the first thing is that she's an incredible maker of soups. She likes soup, she likes cooking for people. Um, she texted me when we were all kicked off, kicked off campus, which I just right now saw um, when she texted me again today, um, and was like, hey, hey, it's like, there's a lot going on. Do you want me to cook for you? And I think that really encapsulates her whole being. She wants to heal you and she wants to do it now and also maybe with food. Um, secondly, she invented putting walnuts in large jars. And I know none of the they invented blank things have really made sense, but if, if you could have seen the largest jar in the world filled exclusively with walnuts that she had just in her apartment, just around. And every time you entered her apartment, she would say, do you want some walnuts? And people would say, no, because no one's really that interested in eating walnuts, but she still wanted you to have that if that's what you wanted. And I think that's an important thing to know. Um, two more things. The first of which is that she also has a food Instagram, which you should follow. And people say it puts Gordon Ramsay to shame. And last thing, she has studied abroad in the great state of te Texas. <laughs> and since that day, all of word that is from Texas, which is actually like a lot of word, um, has adopted her as an honorary member. So if you want to talk to her about Texas, she, I think, would love that. Um, so please welcome again to the virtual stage, Aria. This is a tribute to first year Aria and her bad metaphors. Rules of an Asian poem, AKA rules of all my Asian poems. Talk about food. Specifically talk about curry, the aroma of ginger wafting through the air, the taste of bitter melon as your teeth sinks in, fresh tender mangoes bursting with juice. The more it sounds like softcore porn, the better. Talk about spices, coriander, cardamom, cloves, linger on the sea a little too long. Talk like this like a poet. Talk about spice, talk about how the lack of spice in American food makes me cry, how I long for the cumin of my youth. Talk about coconuts, talk about Asian foods till you get a whole damn grocery catalog. Say, 
where people call me a coconut, but I am not a coconut. The coconut is a metaphor for rice. Talk about rice. Oh, sticky rice. Oh, the long grain basmati. Oh, the tender jasmine. Realize you can't stop talking about the fucking rice. All you can think is rice. How it smells, how it tastes, something chewy, a little sweet. How would you describe it? Talk about the time some boy on Tinder asks you, where are you from? Talk about history, talk about my people, talk about all the trauma your parents carried, but don't call it trauma, call it the weight of sugarcane on his shoulders, a fumbling dance of broken tamil. Make language itself a metaphor until it stops working. Talk about your back, talk about your burden, talk about the bridge called my back, but realize that's not your back. Talk about the boat, talk about fresh off the boat. Talk about the railroads, about the Chinese workers in California, about the Indian traders in Louisiana, how white people hurled coolie, but you're finding new words, but you can't find new words. And after a dozen poems, that's real you realize that's all you fucking have. All you have left is your fucking curry that doesn't exist. The curry that becomes more cliche with every recitation until it starts to disappear. You gather names of food like it somehow fills a void. Coriander, cardamom, cloves, like a bad prayer, but you can't stop saying them because that's the vocabulary you were given. That's the way your identity works here, chopped into something manageable, commodified, digestible, something even you have internalized. The diaspora discourse that you cannot escape and still you can't stop talking about the fucking rice. You still don't know how to describe it or what exactly it means. Chewy, maybe a little sweet. Some, you know, somehow you don't have any more words. They've all been prescribed for you. And so you stop talking. But every day after you wonder, is it worth it in the end to not speak at all? If you wanted to know what it felt like to experience that, um, you just did. So I'm really glad that you got to have that for yourself. Hopefully you can keep that little memory in your little brain and have that for yourself. Um, two things about Aria, once again, sorry, there's a motorcycle outside and it's very loud. Um, the first thing is that I forgot to say what her food Instagram was. So here's the app right now. And the app is not bread dot mostly. Bread is in the thing you eat. I think you can figure it out. Cool, okay. The second thing is that someone said that they felt like they were watching an award-winning one woman show. And you know what? Yeah, it's the truth. And I support that. Cool, okay. Next poet, also a baby. Oh my goodness, we have a billion of them and it's so great. Okay, so our next poet, um, a lot of things written about her in this form. And I'll, I'll comment on the thing that had the most votes in a second. The first thing though, is that apparently she is a bully with a great sense of humor. Bully all caps, so that's cool. Um, she invented smiling, apparently. Like when I say that every single entry of Lizzie's except for like one was about horses, every single ent entry of this poet's except one was about how incredible her smile is. And someone said that she has the prettiest and most radiant smile the world has ever seen. That's it, that's all I'm gonna give you. And then you're gonna get to see her perform her words. So yay, let's welcome to the stage, Alma. Would you still love me if I was a worm? The first time someone texts me this question, the absurdity catches me off guard. But why would you be a worm, I ask, brimming with curiosity. After the fifth time, I just roll my eyes. I am occupied with uncertainty, outstretched on my bedroom floor. Here, my semester and a half of college fades into fog, like I'm grasping at the feeling after a dream. I wonder, how much of myself can I lose in the house that made me? Sinking into the carpet like I am made of nothing, feeling like no one under the soft warmth of my desk lamp. Maybe I am no one without context. 
Maybe I exist only in relation to the institutions that profess my purpose, the people who confirm I can be seen, the deadlines that give me reason to confront another day. I'm starting to think that I've always been right here, huddled on my childhood bed, eyes aglow with the white light of another untitled document. The past year stretches behind me, barren and shifting, blurring before I can recognize a single thing. The future is dark and unknowable, does not mold itself into anything definitive in my mind. I am struck by the realization that I have never been left alone to contend with my present. I cannot distract myself from the now, 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 pressing on my chest without urgency, time on my hands so heavy that I can't feel where my palms begin. How can I trace how much of me has vanished when I can't remember how much there was in the first place? To think I've spent all this time holding myself at arm's length. Maybe this feeling is just the awkwardness of reacquaintance, the nervous song and dance that preludes familiarity. Maybe I will finally unravel the unknown parts of myself, finally look in the mirror and see something alive and transforming, something worthy without justification. Maybe the real question I wish I could ask is would you still love me? Full stop, no conditional worm status required. Even when I forget to text back, forget to wish you happy birthday, forget who I am outside these four walls, I am pleading with you to remember why you loved me in the first place. I am hoping I can remember too. Every show, people say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not writing a love poem. I don't know how to do that. And then 17 poets come out with the most incredible piece of prose anyone's ever thought of in their entire life. Anyway, all of this to say, I'm really mad and I really love that. And also, apparently, the chat says they would all, in fact, love you if you were a worm. So that's big. I think that's a huge win. And I'm really glad you get to have that. Um, wow. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, so our next poet um, is not a baby. They're all done. Um, but she does have gigantic TD energy. And I don't think I have to clarify what I mean by that. So I'm not going to. Um, she also has a beautiful singing voice, is what people said in the chat. And I, it's true. Um, she invented Instagram. And a fact that helps um, cement that knowledge is that just today, someone stole her face and then said, this is me, as if no one would notice. So that's fun, I guess. Um, anyway, she has also, this quarantine, been hosting wonderful poetry workshops with talented poets, including some of the word members in this group. Yay. OK, well, she's incredible. She's phenomenal. She's going to give you some words which will hurt you and delight you with the exact same time. Please welcome to the stage, Kinsale. Yay. Okay. <sighs> Grievances and Complaints was a section from the Declaration of Independence where the colonists listed their former problems with the British government, specifically King George. Grievance 27, the very last complaint states, he has excited domestic insurrections against us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers. The merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. This is the only time natives are mentioned in the De Declaration of Independence. I, a Navajo woman, dream of writing a complaint for every broken treaty. This poem would never end so instead, I write one for every sacred mountain my family comes from, every once so-called frontier they named a battleground for our missing women. One, a world in which I know the war that is my body, in which domestic insurrections dissolve into history. Instead, I count the hours I have lived without a strange man's hand on the small of my back, ushering me from my friends. One, two. In Albuquerque, 
A 14 year old girl has gone missing and her family is told to file a complaint with an office already overrun with the faces of missing sisters. These days, the hurt is merciless, comes in waves and the medicine can only do so much. We turn to each other, Building shelter from our bones, we buckle from the weight and emerge every morning from another dark belly. Native women face violence at more than 10 times the national average, and yet we are the red face on your TVs. The sexy red women with rolling hips in the office. The family is shoved a document and a pen. What is the name of the missing person? Gender. Is she an inhabitant of this frontier? Age sex. The number of Native women that will be assaulted in their lifetime is one in three. I've known destruction, merciless. I have also known sand pressed flat from migration, the ways our mother moved over mountains with their furious racing hearts. If we can make gods out of wood, imagine what we can do with our bodies, create declarations of war as we watch rusted cop cars hightail it out of our end of town. The hardest thing in the world is learning to unfurl yourself from the grip of trauma. Even harder when you're haunted by the ghosts of those who are still with you. We are flightless and yet we stay suspended in midair, burn offering so they do not take what we cannot give for. There is no resolution, no revolution yet that can be doused by legal documents as warfare. All I have to give is the skin off my palms. I offer up my tears until I fill myself with tides pulled by lost sisters doused in moonlight. When I lived in my mother's fossil, I knew what it was to have a hummingbird heart, a face of my own. I wonder if the memory is enough to pull these women back to me in orbit. I would give anything, I say to a photo with eyes like my sister. I would give anything, I would give anything. Wow, um, that was beautiful. Oh, I have so many feelings in my tiny, tiny, tiny infant heart. Um, thank you, Prusk, for spotlighting my video. Um, um, so our, it's unfortunately the last part of the evening and I can't hear you all because I'm in my kitchen listening to my parents, listening to the audio upstairs, the slight echo. Um, but I'm sure you're all very sad about the fact that this is the last poet we have. Um, this last poet is my own parent, who is my heart. This poet makes an excellent Moscow mule, um, which I can confirm. Um, this poet named the sovereign of anti-TikTok, um, uh, which is, a, a complicated and contradictory position that contains multitude in both they love TikTok, but also feel complicatedly about it. Um, this poet loves Love Island um, and is not afraid to talk about it. In fact, we'll talk about it, um, dare I say, at length sometimes. Um, this poet is insanely difficult to wake up. Um, I wish I could remember the, the like, even if you set an alarm, even, even if they set an alarm, this poet might not wake up. It's a good thing they're awake for this show because now we're going to hear the legend, the neutral buff baby, the chaos, the icon, Priska. When I say loving me is like being a Chicago Cubs fan, I mean, there are all these old stories about how I ripened into a curse. I mean, I made most of them up myself. I mean, there was a time when I was great and then a kid in a stadium snatched that away from me. When I say loving me is like being a Chicago Cubs fan, I mean, something that looks like me is presumed to live in the Antarctic desert where half the seasons have become residue 
Every winter, an everlasting night, eager to nestle you in its aching maw. Every summer, bubbling in daylight. Every day, months long. In a terrain that has known two million years about rain, a version of me is presumed to survive. This me has never known a bed with no body, a body without rest, a body too still for its own good. In other words, there is a version of me that does not have to write this eulogy for a still life, that does not know static waters or inverted seasons, only knows necessary hibernation, knows how to make motion out of rest. There is a version of me that knows nothing of curses or hemorrhaging cities. There, a fire is just a fire and not the beginning of a nasty metaphor. There, home is anywhere your soft fur can lay itself down for the night. In other words, there is a version of me that feels a cold wind blow off the nearest body of water and does not see it freeze a city into infamy. There, every creature knows there will come a day when all of this is sunlight. When I say loving me is like being a Chicago Cubs fan, I mean I am a chunk of a miracle city where ice and wind become the stuff of poetry, where a summer is only worth the nearest pool of open water and a winter only worth the next summer. In a Chicago winter, there are no kinfolk, only legends who fail us and rise again. In a Chicago winter, we clean our streets of blood and walk again. We rid our eyes of snow and search again. We choke our highways black and ride again. In Chicago winters, we forget what once tried to kill us and instead look to what we must now survive. In Chicago, there is no shortage of sunshine. Every season reminds us how beauty becomes greater than that it struggles against. I say Chicago and I mean, I would like to be loved like the thought of wind at the base of glaciered buildings, like a lake suffering its last winter. I say Chicago and mean, I would like to survive a winter with you. I would like to know the warmth of a city that has felt its throat empty and fill again. I would like a soft place to lay myself down for the night, somewhere near a boundless lake reaching for an ocean. I say Chicago before every meal, before I lay myself down in my soft place, before I hurry across an empty street, before I wake and greet the living. I say Chicago, and I do not mean the white people who live by Wrigley Field where the Cubs play. I say Chicago before the suburbs open their little mouths to, pra to praise a flag they have never touched. I say Chicago to a field of corn and all the ears slip back into their husks. Chicago is a city only in the way that I am a city, in the way that I am made of what makes me. I say Chicago and my fur goes black, my city melts. I say Chicago, and suddenly, sunrise. Cool. Um, I don't know how to close this out, but lots of people are dancing, so that's fun. Wait, what? Mm. Cool. Um, thank you guys all so much for coming, coming, coming as a, as anywhere, um, which you didn't. Um, your apps, phones, desktops, laptops. Um, but we're so grateful. There were up to enough people that we could have filled ostensibly Sedler Hall um, had we been on campus. Um, but we're not, we're all in our homes. And I have taken a great deal of joy in planning the show, um, in being in relation with all of these beautiful bits, in writing the poem that I wrote literally this morning slash early afternoon. Um, and so grateful to have you guys um, showing up in the chat for us, showing up on our Facebook page, um, even though you very much didn't have to. What other things to do with your Saturday night? You could have been watching Gilmore Girls, which is what I would have been doing um, if I wasn't here. Um, but thank you all so, so much. And I hope that everyone has a beautiful rest of your Saturday. Have a beautiful summer.